Yeah, thank you guys all for coming in. This is uh, One Step Apart. It's uh, the infamous Bobby Peterson. Hello, hello. And myself, he is our, he is our uh, financial committee Financial chair. Wealth Committee Chair. Right? Yeah, exactly. Marty and I have been taking this thing off and kind of figuring out a few different ways to make it beneficial for the whole office. And Sean brought in this great series, which we're piggybacking on, and this has got a lot of good information for everybody. So I'm excited. I'm excited. And I just want to say, just for legitimacy purposes, um, how are you, man? Uh, I own. Uh, I have a good amount of rental properties. I uh, have some socks and bonds and stuff like that. I've been yeah, selling real right estate now. for like six years. Um, I do have about twenty-one rentals right now. So I've been accumulating well for a few years now, and just kind of share some knowledge that I have picked up over the years between buying and selling homes of my my own, flips, rentals, obviously selling real estate, things like that. I'll touch on like stocks and. Uh, a, a variety of things that kind of just go into wealth building. Yeah. I've done a lot of things. I've flipped in the past. I own rentals. Uh, I own businesses, several businesses. And so I, I do more of the business side. Obviously, we do have stock funds as well. But uh, happy so to answer what you see. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Bobby, Bobby's very humble about it. <laughs> uh, but we are, we are both uh, millionaires, if you want to say it, net worth, net worth style. So, um, and we're happy to bring what we've learned over our careers to you. So, yes. are we good? Yeah. Woo. Good. Are there from there? Oh, there it goes. Okay, our goals with this class is to to help you understand that wealth and financial freedom is achievable to anyone. So, I know some of you may think this is like. Some mysterious solution out there that some people know and other people don't. I'm out of the loop. It's not really that. Um, to help you understand, there are fundamental rules and habits that you must learn and adopt in life daily to achieve financial success. The thing is, it is a game. And the problem is, is in our educational system, no one tells you, here are the rules. Right. <laughs> here are the rules of the game. And so no one tells you, our goal is to make sure you are financially literate so you can achieve a life by design. And I think okay. finding people to learn from, I think over the time when I've been in real estate now, I've been around so many millionaires and people that have done it on a completely different scale than I could ever imagine, but just learning from other people, and whether it's John, myself, Michael Soros here, a number of other people that are, um, you know, create a, a, a large amount of wealth in their, their time being in this, this environment, but um, we're just going to go through some different steps and really just kind of give us some some points on how to how to be involved with financial okay. So this first class I'm gonna go over is, um, oh, we gotta go over expectations. So we ask you to listen and engage. Um, this class will be twice as good if you participate. <laughs> um, do the exercises with purpose. We're gonna have exercises. It's not just gonna talk about stuff, because honestly, you all can go watch YouTube and people will talk about wealth, or podcasts talk about wealth all the time. We're gonna have exercises of what we do in our own lives to make sure that you start adopting the habits. The first thing you need is mindset around wealth. Once you have the mindset, you can start doing and having what wealthy people do, but you need a wealth mindset. And so we're gonna teach you the rules on that. But we ask you to do it. Well, start with mindsets. If you come to series not engaged, you may know the rules of wealth, but you'll never have it because wealth is first up mindset and habits. You have to understand that. Wealth starts with you. It starts with between your ears. It always does. And if it's and if you don't, the reason I'm putting this here first and not talking about how do you do your budget and how do you do your finances, all that, we aren't going to talk about that. But we start here because if you don't think wealthy, you're never going to have the money because you're not going to have the habits to save and, and do the things you need to do to structure your life and budget for you, right? So uh, what happens in wealth building stays in wealth. I just want that out there. Kind of like Las Vegas, right? So, uh, <laughs> our Disneyland, our Disneyland, apparently. <laughs> so what happens here is um, feel free to talk. I have had talks with many agents about their financial situation, helping them out of them and coach a lot of people uh, out of that. And just so you know, feel free to talk um, in this room. We will not spread. Um, this is your first class. So this is going to be the series, your dysfunctional relationship with money. Then we're going to talk personal finances. We're going to get, get really real with your personal finances. We're going to ask you to bring bank statements. If you have a budget, we're going to ask you to budget. Get really real about your money. 
and there's going to be some crying and some tears, but that's okay. So, um, and we're going to get really real because the whole first thing you need to do is get real about how you're doing this, right? So, um, and we're going to go to some of that today, actually. <laughs> um, for your first goal, I think the goal of business is profit. As an agent, you are lucky. You're in a you're in an industry that produces most of the millionaires in America today. <laughs> Literally, you're in. You have access to that. So. The first thing we're going to talk about is getting your business right. Because a lot of you are going to be like, yeah, I can save. I really need to generate income, right? And the first way you can generate income is with your business. We're talking about agent finances, business structure. What's best for us? How do I set that up? How do I ensure I get profit? How do I ensure I get savings? And what do I need to do? Then we're going to go, uh, your first option will be tax deferred strategies from SEP IRS, 401ks, other things you can do as a business owner right now, as an agent, that you can take advantage of where you can save a lot of money tax deferred to help start building wealth. And take invest in some of those stocks and bonds. And, and, and finally, uh, this is going to be a Bobby specialty. Now you have you have some money. Now we figured it all out. You got your money. What do we do with it? And we're going to talk about the vehicles of wealth building. We're going to touch on investing, flipping, house hacking, or multifamily. And obviously, this is more real estate focused because obviously you have access to real estate. But we're going to talk about how to do these things at a higher level. Right. So. I think what's great about this is I've been in the industry and business for six years now. I've never been to a class like this. I did go to college to study business. But breaking down everything specifically for realtors and how to set up our businesses, how to set up 401ks and IRAs. I've had an IRA for about three or four years now, and I still have questions on, like, am I doing it properly? Where should it, where should it be allocated if it's a 401k or SEP? So this is all invaluable information. Talking about our mindset here, our personal finances, and then really going into the investment flipping, or hacking, house hacking, everything like that. Like it took me six years to, to get all the information that I have. At this point, it's really benefited me. And being able to go through a class like this is really going to be important, I think, for everybody newer in the industry or if you've been here for a number of years and just you never know what little tidbit you're going to pick up throughout our, our five yeah, or six I, series classes. I, I want to point out also, Bobby took six years and. I know he started what he started learning multi hindsight. He got his personal finances well. You got you got your business going strong, and then he went into this world. So I I talked to a lot of agents like I want to flip, I want to invest, and I tell people get your business right, get this right, because no one no one gets there without going through this process. Because I can tell you what you need you you need money right? <laughs> some way you need money right? or someone else's money or someone else's money. But even if you have, so, if, even if you're going to borrow someone else's money, they have to trust you. And how are they going to trust you if you're a disaster financially, right? No one's going to trust you, right? So Bobby and I can go to people and like, hey, we want to borrow this large amount of money. They are okay because they trust us because they know how we run things, right? So even if you want to borrow other people's money, you can. They got to trust you though, right? So, okay. I think it. But once again, it all starting with the mindset habits and. Start to become obsessed with learning about money, learn about yeah. different tools to, to invest, in. learning about how other people are creating wealth through different real estate advantages or, or with your own business and just studying it on a daily basis. It's just like, it's like working out, right? If we're trying to get healthy and we're eating right, working out consistently, we know we're not supposed to drink soda, we're not supposed to, supposed to do these different things. Our wealth and our finances are the same way. There's a number of ingredients that go into what the overall wealth is gonna be. And we're going to look in this, you know, next, today and other, uh, the next couple of weeks is what our goal for retirement is, how we're going to be able to achieve that, and whether it's just through stocks and whether it's through rental properties and just go through it all. That was working before. Like what? Just doesn't like it. Yeah. <laughs> a, a few questions to ask yourself, so if you can roll through these. Well, there it is. What does it mean to be wealthy to you? All right. yeah. To have all my expenses covered, including my lifestyle through passive income. I like that. What about you? Anyone else? What's wealthy to you? I heard an interesting one this morning. Um, they're talking about being wealthy is it's, it's not how much stuff you have, but it's how much time. How much time can you afford? Um, mm -hmm. If you stop working today, how long would your wealth last you? A lot of people said, what's retirement? Retirement is, I have to make choices in my life of exactly what I want to do, right? <laughs> At any given time. Uh, do you have a disruptive relationship with money? Oh, yeah. Well, I was just going to sum up kind of just what Carnegie and Fred said. Basically, is, is having the time to be able to do all the things that I would do with the money that I don't have to worry about because I have the money to do it. 
like trading money for time. Yeah, money for time is a big thing. We're gonna you're gonna see is a key is money for time, right? In this business, you know, it takes your weekend, your evenings, your family time, and things like that. That's all something we gotta be protective of. For over time, in the beginning, it might not be that big of a deal, but later on, you know, you want to trade money for time. How can we do that? Additionally, you know, we're in a business that no one's gonna pay for our retirement, right? My parents were city workers and did their 25, 30 years or something like that. There's nothing available for us. And I think one of the things we've really got to, to realize is where are we going to be at in 30 years and what do we need to set ourselves for our 20 years or 10 years or whatever it is, just making sure that we realize like it, it's on us. And we got to make those smart financial decisions in order to set us up for retirement or at whatever point you want to be financially independent and be able to take trade money for time. And, and I want to piggyback on that. I told you, what's the great thing about real estate? Why we all got in it? Because there's no ceiling. You can make it as big as you want. But I also told someone, what's the bad part about it? There's no floor, right? <laughs> Literally, you could do a lot of work and get nothing, right? So there's no floor. So to build a floor for you, you can constantly build that floor where you're always having income in. I mean, you just got to build it yourself because you're in business for yourself, right? So you, essentially, you're going to build a floor for you. How are we going to build this floor? How high do you want that sky rise to go in your life, right? What kind of view you want from the top, right? <laughs> so, okay. Who has a defensible re re relationship with money? You pretty much do if you don't have money. So, <laughs> it's like the definitions. Yeah. Uh, what's real property? You know, what's you real property? Money, you can have money and then just spend it. Just, yeah. Just on the same part. Yeah. So, so if you don't have, have money, money, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That... Well, you can live in paycheck to paycheck. You're pretty good playing. Can anyone be financially wealthy? Can anyone? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. So, wealth mindset, truth number one. If you don't do the right things with money, will, if you do the right things, money will come to you. If you do not have money, then you are doing the wrong things. <laughs> so I say this law, and it seems kind of stupidly simple. But so many people do the same thing they always done, hoping to get more money. And you're going to have to realize the habits you have on spending, saving, how you look at money has to change if you're going to be wealthy. And when you change those habits, and he says, or you can find people with money, those people start coming around. Right? You start meeting people. You start meeting millionaires. You start meeting people that says, hey, I want to invest with this person. Right? There's, there's a lot of wealthy people that says, I like my time. I'll invest in people who want to hustle. Right? <laughs> And you say, hey, I, I got the deal. I'll hustle it. I'll make it happen. Here's the money. Give me this return. All right? <laughs> There's a ton of people that do that. But you got to have, you got to do that. So fundamental truth. I always call it big mo. I mean, it could be like, we're just not talking about this. But if it's with your real estate business or investing career or whatever it is, if you got momentum going, just sometimes and, you, and people can see that, they'll come to you with different opportunities. They will come to you if they want to sell their house or buy their house. But just a number of opportunities come with momentum. And, you know, money. Money starts finding you after a while with different opportunities. Um, I'm going to read a little story. Called, this book is Psychology of Money, but don't worry. At the end, we're going to talk about sources where you can maintain this. Uh, bought, yeah, maintain this uh, so, so. Um, Ronald Reed was born in rural Vermont. He was the first person in his family to graduate high school. All, more, all the more impressive was the fact that he hitchhiked to campus each day. For those who knew Ronald Moore, there wasn't much else worth mentioning. His life was about as low-key as they come. Ronald fixed cars at a gas station for 25 years and swept floors for JCPenney for 17 years. He bought a two-bedroom house for, at $12,000 at age 38 and lived there for the rest of his life. He was widowed at age 50 and never remarried. A, a friend recalled that his main hobby was chopping firewood. <laughs> Reed died in, in 2014 at age 92, which is when the humble rural janitor made international headlines. 2,813,503 Americans died in 2014. Fewer than 4,000 of them had a net worth over $8 million when they passed. Ronald Reed was one of them. In the will, the former janitor left $2 million to his stepkids and more than $6 million to the hospital and library. Those who knew Reed were baffled. Where did he get all the money? It turned out there was no secret. There was no lottery win and no inheritance. Reed saved, a little as he could, saved what little he could and invested in blue chip stocks. Then he waited for decades on end as tiny savings compounded to more than $8 million. That's it, from janitor to philanthropist. A few months before Ronald Reed died, another man named Richard was in the news. Richard Fuscone was everything Ronald 
Ronald Reed was not. A Harvard-educated Merrill Lynch executive with an MBA, Fuscone had such a successful career in finance, he had retired in his 40s to become a philanthropist. Merrill, former Merrill CEO David Kamansky praised Fuscone's business savvy, leadership skills, sound judgment, and personal integrity. Cream's business magazine included him as a 40 under 40 list of uh, successful business people. But then, like the gold, gold coin skipping tech executive, everything fell apart. In the mid-2000s, Fuscone borrowed heavily to expand an 18,000 square foot home in Greenwich, Connecticut that had 11 bathrooms, two elevators, two pools, seven garages, and cost more than 90000 a month to maintain. Then the 2008 financial crisis hit. The crisis hurt virtually everyone's finances and apparently turned for, for scones into dust. High debt and, and illiquid assets left him bankrupt. I currently have no income, he allegedly told the bankruptcy judge in 2008. First, his Palm Beach house was foreclosed. 2004, he lost a Greenwich mansion. Five months before Ronald Reed left his fortune to charity, Ronald Fuscone's home, which were all, which where guests called the thrill of dining and dancing atop to see covering to see through covering on the home's indoor swimming pool, was sold at foreclosure auction for 75 percent less than the insurance company figured out it was worth. Ronald Reed was patient. Richard Fuscone was greedy. That's all it took to eclipse the massive education and experience gap between two between the two. So I want to read that because there are some fundamental rules. It's not about how much you bake, correct? Right? It's how much you keep. <laughs> right? So I just know, no, I'm not saying that you need to be like the janitor, but what did he do? He just methodically followed the rules of wealth, even though he was only saving a little bit every time. He just found, and we're going to talk about compound interest here. Yeah, in 30, 40 years, it's going to add up. It's, it's going to add up to a lot. Having a more simplistic life that he was able to live by and live within his means where you got, you know, the other gentleman in Wall Street and a lot of people, John knows a lot more people than I do, probably that 2008, 2010 <laughs> yeah. time frame, yeah. you know, his people crashes. are spending every dollar that they earn, not realizing, you know, your market's kind of artificially up there. You could say the same about right now. It doesn't seem like we're going to take a, a dip by any means, but we're certainly in a crazy high, high market and prices are high and commissions are good, but, you know, what are you doing with those dollars that come in and where are you putting some of it? Taxes and some of the savings, and investing some. You know. So with that, who was wealthy in that story? Who was wealthy? The janitor. But was he really wealthy? Was he living the life he wanted? It yeah. sounds like it. Yeah. Yeah. Clearly, he was right. So yeah. his favorite thing was chopping wood. But that's okay if he found joy in chopping wood. Right. That's the life he could have had any life he wanted. Right? right at that kind of money, he could have had any life he wanted, and he chose that life. So in the end. Right? Is he wealthy? Yeah, because it doesn't have to look wealthy, but he chose that life and he had the, he had the ability to choose that life, right? So, he wanted so. Um, well, I mean, financially independent, too. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. Years before he retired, I'm sure he could have took off and done whatever he we wanted. wanted. <laughs> but he wanted this more simple life, <laughs> travel or whatever it was, but he had the ability to. Yes. That's he made a choice, which was beautiful. So, the financial definition of wealth and. Uh, uh, Rich had an advantage because he already knows this. So. Uh, financial wealth is when you have accumulated enough money and investments that generate sufficient passive income to be able to achieve your personal goals without work. So I ask all of you, if you stopped working, do you have enough money in the bank or investments that is paying you enough passive income to live on your current lifestyle? Then if you do that, then if you don't, then you don't have enough money. It's not that. So that's all about investing in the proper vehicles to get you that passive income and, and finding and that's what a, they are. And that's a big thing, passive income, right? right? Like, what's passive? For the most part, we're all self-employed. Making, right? making money while you sleep. Yeah, it means something Being that is gen owner. generating income to you where you don't actively work on it. The most easy, obviously, is like a rental, right? You may even not manage it, right? You can find out the management and at the same time it's generating income to you and you're not actively working on it day to day. Right? So John put in a vending machine. Yeah. It's passive income. It is passive income. <laughs> if you want to know what I all those little things add up, right? You get all like that twenty Yeah, I'm not reading really, vending machines all over Sacramento. And I and I want to give opportunity to Sam. I said, Hey Sam, I'm gonna put a vending machine. Well, you and you and take 
Awesome. Bobby Taylor were talking about a vending machine for like, I don't know, a year? Year and a half, man. <laughs> <laughs> I ran the number. <laughs> I needed a Sam on my team, though, right? So, you to be <laughs> I didn't have Sam on my team. No, but I had opportunity. Sam, now he's not having Sam a wants, Sam wants more passive income. She's trying to grow out of And I said, hey, I'll tell you what. I'll buy it. I'll fund it. You work it. I'll give you 30% profit share. That means whatever profit we make, you get 30% of it. Right. right. I'm not greedy. I'm not greedy because I'm just looking for this. Right. And I will hand off the work, no problem. And you decide find someone who's who has the money. Find someone who has the money. Says so I find someone who has the time. Right. Yeah. Just trading money for time. Yeah. So I found someone who has the time to do it, and I have the money to do it. Good partnership. Right? That's it. But it's it's running a business or having some type of investment. I was talking with Raul last week, and he's investing in like e-commerce. I don't know if you guys have heard about that, but it's. It's buying Airbnb, or I'm sorry, uh, Amazon online stores and Walmart online stores, and, um, FedEx and uh, UPS online stores. This is another passive income source. It's not just real estate, which is what we're primarily going to talk about in this class, and, and Airbnbs and short-term rentals and, and long-term rentals, vacation rentals, things like that. But there's a number of different opportunities and like how are these little things that we're going to add up to get us financially dependent and being able to trade. Money. And the good part is we're going to do the series, but also we're going to bring additional ones where we're going to try to talk about short-term rentals. <clears throat> and then we're going to repeat the series, so don't worry. You're always going to be at a level that you can learn from there, so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, fundamental truth number two. You must be wealthy in your mind before you can have financial wealth. Financial wealth is a state of mind. Financial wealth is an outward manifestation of an inner focus. It results from steering your thoughts toward a specific financial goal. A specific financial goal. I think this goes into having like discipline, right? I mean, with social media and anything on TV and advertisements, and we're seeing what other people are doing with their money. And you got got a millionaire on Instagram that you're paying to do, and they're, they're going, to, you know, right around their Lamborghinis or taking private flights to Vegas or going to these expensive events like how do we have that discipline to just stay in our lane and grow our wealth over time so the most common mistake that people make is most people in life and money look outside of themselves to achieve financial wealth when they should look inside they're always saying wow that man if i had that money right, right? if i had his skills and and i had that opportunity I would have done the same thing. And the, and the answer is actually no, you wouldn't because it starts with here. You would have never been given that opportunity if you weren't right in the mind on finances, right? So uh, so if you're looking for, if you're pointing outside of yourself for reasons why you're in your situation financially, uh, you need to stop. That's the number one thing you have to stop because in the end, you control all your money. You make every freaking decision on every money, every dollar and penny you spend, right? <clears throat> You do, and earn for that matter. So <laughs> and, earn. and earn, right? So you you you're in real estate. You literally determine how much you earn. You you literally determine that. Right? That's the beauty of it. Damn. Okay, we're out. Well, it starts with what you think about money first. It's understanding money and treating your money as an investment rather than something you spend. Imagine you had a million dollars. What would you? Do? So well, if you had a million dollars right now, I hand you a million dollars. What would you do, Sean? We would talk about opening. Different businesses that are that can obviously generate more income. Well, I've been fortunate to be talking with best friends of Bob and then have you to understand what it takes to actually build wealth. So I'd be investing in businesses and then maybe go on a vacation. Just a little one. What, what else? If, if I had any million dollars, what would you do? Pay my house off and my husband would retire, and then all of his money with kids coming into retirement would be money that is set aside using my real estate money for everything. Huh? What else? What would you? Anything else? I'd buy more rentals and things of this nature so I can have that passive income. Anything else? Those, what would you do? I was going to do what he was going to do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, use that money uh, to just make real estate. As Bobby was saying, when people says, I want to be a millionaire, I trust me, I hear that every time when they. I, Aiden comes in and says, what do you want to do? I want to be a millionaire, right? They all say. And I say, great. 
What they really mostly say is, I want to be able to live the millionaire's lifestyle. That means I want to spend a million dollars living my life every year, and that would be an awesome life, right? And really, I tell you, well, if you make a million and then you spend it, you're not a millionaire anymore, right? <laughs> So, um, <laughs> I think breaking some of this down as we're saying, like, find rental properties, invest in different businesses, is, is dissecting and studying, like, what is the ROI of the money that you're putting down? Where are the areas that you want to buy rental? Is it even California? Is it out of the area? How are you going to make sure that you're, you're, you're utilizing your money and getting a good return on investment? You know, in the stock market, they're 8 to 10% or something like that. How can I beat that with real estate? There's like two different approaches. There's you know, the Dave Ramsey approach of paying off all your debt and then saving money and building investments from there. Or the overall investor point of view of buying more rental properties and using that money and growing it in different ways and, and leveraging your money to debt. Right? So we're going to talk about a number of those. That's true, especially with the interest rate that now low, use somebody else's money. Yeah. Why you have right. to use yours? Right. Yeah, money you can borrow right. money for three percent right now. Inflation is three percent. So if you put this money in the bank right now, you're almost losing money. Yeah, it's not generating any money. You're not generating anything on a savings account. Correct. And he was talking about ROIs. It's very important to understand interest rates, and we'll talk about that when we talk about investing. But what well, ROI is your return on investment? Rates. What 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 interest rates you should be targeting for type of investments and what you're looking at? And some of that's going to be if I'm if I'm 55 and retiring, I, I'm going to trade risk. I'm going to want less risk. So I'm going to get lower returns, right? So we're going to talk about that in the future class about risk and returns. Um, but you, yeah, I mean, I target things at 12 to percent, 10 to 12 percent returns right now when I invest, and I am looking. I'm studying out of state markets that I think may be work, worthwhile that I can invest in. So if I can't find it in my local market, I'm looking somewhere else to find those returns, right? So. You're only truly wealthy when you have enough wealth that is sufficient to fund your personal mission. That means all the wealthy people track and account their money regularly and measure it against their wealth goal. All right? I'm not. Bobby, do you know where your money is? I know exactly where my money is on all my businesses. <laughs> so anyone who is wealthy knows where they want to go and knows where they are. And I recommend that you touch that monthly, at least. Monthly, quarterly, certainly setting a goal, right? You know, I think when we're business planning, and we're about that time when we're business planning for 2022 for our real estate business, what are we looking at for our net worth? Well, how much money do we want to like, we'll talk about this more later, but in tracking it, if you start having some money, you know, analyzing if you're getting that rate of return that you're looking for, and, uh, so if you're, so if you're not one to watch your finances, you're like, I make enough money, I just spend my bills, um, you're building a house of cards. I can tell you that right now. I know a lot of people, when the market turned, were screwed because they had that kind of mentality right, on their finances. And they didn't know where their money was. And because of that, they were over leveraged. And they got in trouble. Right? So. All right. Net worth. You should have a printout in front of you. This little exercise, this is the exercise part. It's okay if you have a negative net worth. What is net worth? Anyone know what net worth is? Assets minus liabilities. That means what do you own that has value? And what do you owe? So I need you guys to work on this as an in-house class. So work on this net worth. So what do you own? If you have a house, how much is it worth? You put that in there. On the other side, I have a mortgage on it. What's the mortgage amount? That's a liability, right? I have back taxes. That's a liability. You don't have to be exact. We can be rough numbers. Liability. I have student loans. I have a car loan. I have credit card debt. All liabilities. Put the balance, not the payment, the balance that is owed, okay? On the positive side, how much is in your bank account? How much in your checking account, your savings account? Do you have any investments? Do you have a 401k? Do you have a business banking account? How much money is in there? Cash on hand is not in account. It's like natural money, right? Cash on hand is cash. Yeah. What's liquid? So it's bank accounts, savings <coughs> accounts, 
Stuff you could go to the bank and draw right now, cash. Oh. Cash. And don't worry, we're doing this exercise because sometimes it's going to be scary. And I tell you the first time, every time that someone comes to me for advice on how to close them on finances, the first thing we do is your net worth. Because you need to judge this, this is going to be the judge of are you going to meet your wealth goal? Because if we're going to have passive income, we're going to have to have sufficient investments to warrant your income, right? That passive income. So my house, 100% accurate? It's going to be hard to be 100% accurate in this class because there's going to be exact balances. What I recommend is putting rough estimates right now, but I recommend between now and the next one that you that you solidify the actual numbers, right? You know, I think my mortgage is around here. I think my car loan's around here. That's fine. But I want you to get a number. I want you to have a number that says, what's my net worth? Everywhere. Everywhere. Because I have some everywhere, and that's, I cannot calculate the accuracy right now. Because this is market in, back in Dubai years. So. Well, just guess. I'm sure you have some estimate. Of what <laughs> I have. Yeah, just <laughs> guesstimate. What do you think it's going to be? You, you're in the market. You know what it's like to right? <laughs> Oh. John, in your opinion, uh, is your personal home a liability or an asset? Liability, there's a So you do the you do the value of your home? So the value of your home. So for example, well, I just wanted like his opinion. So the, I know a lot of people the home my so my home value is four eight, right? But I owe two seven. Yeah, he's talking about because you live there. It's okay. not necessarily Correct. rental property, investment property. That's okay. great. It's philosophical. Yeah, it's a philosophical question. I view it as an asset personally. Yeah. Because my plan is is if I wanted to go somewhere and move to my final destination, it would be I would be turning that house into a rental, right? So. Yeah. All right, because you know the the book Rich Dad Poor Dad. Yeah. It says it's not. Yeah. It's like considers it a liability. A liability, yeah. yeah. Well, if it has a mortgage. Only the mortgage would be the liability. Yeah, yeah. Whatever difference yeah, is in the value. That's how I do Well, he considers a liability because it, because it costs you money to maintain, right? Yeah. Because so. it's taking money away. It takes money away right? from you. Yeah. But I, I always say you have to live, right? You have to live. There's no, there's no, you don't hide from that. Don't hide from that, right? You have to live, right? So. But I get what he's saying because he's saying, can you count that as passive income? You can't because it's not bringing you money, right? Yeah, but it's only that's it. Yeah, so it can help in other ways. That's why I said just calculate it. It's in like the, the great debate oh. between like <laughs> guru investment. Yes, yeah. and honestly, it's a debate that doesn't really matter. Yeah, cool yeah. and you could have it as investment if you house hacked. Yeah, it would be an investment at that point. Or if right? you sold it, you're not getting taxed on it. You don't get paid off the debt. Yeah, so it is an asset because you can't take it and pay off that. Yeah. Yeah. Like funds that are like the count is four, and then cash on hand is just whatever of that is like available. Cash on hand is just cash. Cash, cash is cash. So it's not like an investment account. I have to sell some stocks to get it. That's not cash. That's illiquid, right? So it's only like your bank account, your savings account, maybe a money market. Oh, right. How you have it written on your cash on hand, followed by check. Oh, yeah. I guess if you have mattress money. So. Well, so I guess what I'm saying is like there's money in my account and some of it's accounted for for like bills and everything. Yeah, so if if, if, so if you know the balance is 3000 but you know bills are about to hit and it's only going to be 500 at the end of it, then put 500 yeah. right? so, yeah. <laughs> You want this to be as real as possible. How's this? If you're going to lie to yourself on the numbers, everyone can lie to themselves on the numbers, but it's not. it's only going to hurt you, right? The only person you're hurting is yourself. So we want to put our home furnishing in We could. What do you have? Do you have rings? No, 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 no. Yeah, you should put zero on that yeah, one. Yeah, all that. Right? Your home furnishing. Yeah, we we could have sell, 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 sell your home furnishing. Yeah. <laughs> the yeah, it would be like art. Like Somerset, they have home furnishings, right? Like. on my real estate property. My house is worth for a happy but my total net capital is still be like two hundred. You just put you just put your mortgage. Put your mortgage. Oh, so we're gonna so you deduct your mortgage. That's your equity. Your equity is your your equity is your net worth. Right? How's everyone doing? I'm sorry, I'm making you think in the afternoon. I know. So. Well, on top of it, it's really hard. Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. Yeah. So 
So I, so I have. Yes. What we owe. I'm sorry. What you own is so for your home, it's going to be what your home is worth, which is a real estate agent. I hope you, if you own, I hope you know that somewhat. I do, but where, 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 where <laughs> on you put that on? You put that on home, right on the, so the, the left side of the sheet is assets. The right side is liabilities. Assets are things you own that have value. Assets are, I mean, liabilities on the left side. So if you look at home, that's your value of your home. If you look at the other side, it says mortgage. That's your liability. Oh. Oh. So my current debt's on my house. What current debt do you have? Credit cards, student loans, car loans. You don't have anything. I don't have anything. <laughs> I don't have anything about it. <laughs> I don't have anything about it. <laughs> so on a household then, so like I've got zero medical, like don't keep credit card debt. Yeah. On household, what is household? <laughs> <laughs> like what you said. Like furniture, like, 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 yeah, some people yeah, take out loans to oh, what's up, John? Some people take out loans, so when it comes to rent, rent is not so rent doesn't so your income and expenses are not in net worth, net worth is how valuable. If we die, if you passed away and we sold everything and paid off your debts, how much will be left over? That's net worth. That's easy. Yeah, exactly. So if you passed away and we sold everything you had and we paid off any debt you had with that money, how much would be left over? And sometimes it's going to be if we sold everything you had, there's still owed money. That's called a negative net worth. And that's okay. You may have a negative net worth. You can cry if you want to. <laughs> you do better than a fight. What? If somebody cries, are you going to give a prize or something? I'll cry right now. I'll cry right now for a prize. Bobby will give a free 30 minute consultation. <laughs> Rental process. Starting line is where you are. Well, it depends. Like, how much you have can you translate into how much money? Right? Assume you could conservatively invest and put it in bonds and get 5% return. That's about as safe as you can get. How much money would you have monthly? Could, it, could, you, could you live off that? No. <laughs> so it may look better on paper, but if you took that money and invested it somewhere and got a decent return, could you live off that investment? Mm -hmm. Yes. What do you consider a decent return? Well, right now in my life, I like 10 to 12. But. 10 to 12 if you're like an active investor. An active investor. But I mean, the stock If you're passive, is, yeah. You go to the S&P 500, they're doing 20% or 17% the past like five years. But yeah. Average time, is it's probably like 8%, 7%. Yeah. So literally, you could do... That's what I was saying. I, I, I gun for at least eight because eight, you could put your money in an index fund that just mimics the S&P 500. And over decades, you will get an 8% average. That has been historic. So literally, you could put your money and just not even touch it and get an 8% return right now. So I look for something that's going to be more than a return. I'll just park it there. Right. So I think Merrill Lynch did a study of all of their investors and funds that average best return died. Got about the account. Yeah. Here's the thing. You have people who want to pay money to pick stocks when usually over 80%. So there's people who are professionally paid to pick stocks, right? Only about 20% of them average every year better than the S&P 500. So literally, you can go and invest in a stock fund, literally a mutual fund that only invests in the S&P 500. Like whatever companies are in the S&P 500, that's what they invest in. And literally, you would perform better than 80% of the people who pick stocks every year. Right? Picking that. <laughs> 
And we're going to go a little bit. S&P 500 is the top 500 companies in America. In America. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just 500 companies. Yeah. All right. Everyone good? All right. Any ahas from this? And I want to point out there's some psychology money. No one's stupid. Some of you are going to have some negative self-talk right. about where you are. And just know you're not stupid. You just made decisions based on the best knowledge you have at the time. And that's okay, because we're going to fix that. So don't beat yourself up. But any ahas from this? Any? They were surprised? Disgusted? Yeah. <laughs> Surprise, definitely. I guess, like, you know, when you don't, when you have a dysfunctional relationship with money, you don't really consider yourself as having even a net worth. Like, you know, you know, I know me, for instance, like, I never was like, oh, this is my net worth. Like, looking at this number, it's like, for real? <laughs> like, <laughs> like, it's not negative? Like, wait a minute, it's not zero? Yeah. Like, that's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> so that that's was good. an aha. Good. So. That's a good aha. That's a good aha. Yeah. <laughs> One of, the thing, one of the things that I, I realized is that I wish I would have uh, taken all my passive income I made from Keller Williams in the 20 years. Uh, I made a lot of money over the years, passive income from various different agents that have come underneath, what have you, and everything else. If I had put that into a vehicle, any sort, yeah. my goodness. <laughs> and I can tell you, um, when the team leader, I was broker when the team leader real opened, my, kind of forced me into it for this. So, but um, I was very reluctant, but actually one of the most, because I knew it was going to be a lot of work. You know, but I, one thing that, that really attracted to me wasn't the salary. Or that. What really attracted me was the profit share. Because yeah. yeah. uh, I know I'm going to recruiting. I'm going to get a lot of the recruits. Mm -hmm. And I know passive income. And I can make the business good. And if the business is good, then I get profit share, right? And actually, my, my wife is like, What's that deposit you keep getting? And I said, oh, it's the profit share. She's like, keep doing that. Right? So, <laughs> but I, I'm happy because the, um, the other month was the first time I exceeded $1,000 a profit share. Right? So that's, a, that's nothing I work on. It yeah. just happens. Right? And that's a beautiful thing with a couple of things. Too, so. Yeah. And, and that's what I was saying because I've been in this 20 years. And I've exceeded that. A couple times. Yeah. And if you think of a guy, a guy like Stan, Stan Reed, who a lot of knows where the red hat, he's been getting profit. Crazy. Um, <laughs> and, and I want you to note that that's a definition of passive income with no risk. Yeah. Literally, you refer them. You don't even have to help them. And you have to put money up. <laughs> you have to put money up for yeah. money. So, you know, and that's what attracted me about it was it was a non money investment passive income source. I was like, that is beautiful. That is beautiful because. And it takes time to develop, but that's okay. Um, part of the reason Stephen T is teaching our classes, I told him opportunity, and he knows because he's trying to retire. I said, hey, teach these classes. You're only going to get this little pay for the classes, but every pro every person you coach that joins the office, guess what? They're going to end up in your downline because, like, I like Stephen T. He put him as my sponsor, right? And that's why when you see our quarterly awards and Stephen T is winning most recruits, you see it, you see it, you see the pattern, right? So. I think uh, my aha of this exercise, and I kind of looked at it probably earlier in the year, but just realizing you buy something or invest in something years ago, you truly just let it do its thing, that you're going to see the results. And I bought my first property in 2016, I think, and I bought a few every year since then. Um, and over time, with appreciation, it's kind of done its thing, plus you got the tenants paying down the mortgage, plus like, you know, I've been investing in um, mutual funds and things like that. So honestly, just letting either compound interest do its thing in the, in the stock market or allowing appreciation. supply and demand appreciation, rents going up, whatever it is, just giving whatever investment vehicle you're looking to do time. It's not going to happen overnight. Nothing's really going to happen overnight. For me, one flip is not going to make or break me. One rental property isn't. But adding all of them together, and over time, just letting them do its thing is, is the beauty about these exercises and analyzing properties and what it's going to take you in 10, 20, 30 years. I can say I bought a foreclosure auction home at 27500 in 2009, part of the recession. It's been the best, my wife was like, it's been our best investment vehicle ever. It's returned. I got it comped at, I got it appraised at 450 which is ridiculous. That's ridiculous. So, part of it. 
huge cash on cash report. <laughs> <laughs> it's been rented ever. It's been rented since 2009 till now. Wow. The whole time, so I've been making money on that, and I have a huge amount of equity. That's right. So kind of go on the, the flip side of what Bobby said. Uh, obviously, looking at the assets and the appreciation, or looking at the liabilities. I remember the first time I ran this exercise for myself at Fleet. I hate to use the word fear, but it really like solidified the fear of credit cards and like debt. Mm -hmm. Like when you really looked at it, you're like, oh my god, I don't feel like I'm negative, but when you add everything all together, you're like, crap. Like, mm -hmm. I, and where where is that money? What 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 do I still have to share for it? Yeah, and, and that's the power of it. We say, get your net worth and check it every month. Right. Guess what? You'll be like, I want to buy that. Oh wait. Ah, like I don't want to put another thing on the other side of the line, right? <laughs> yeah, it'll start making you make decisions. That's why I talk about mind mindset around wealth. Mindset. That's why you look at it because it starts making you make decisions better, right? So that's the point of doing this. Exercise. Me, it's opened my eyes now because half I have my kids. because my husband takes care of finances, so I don't know. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah, so well, heaven forbid, what if your husband passed, your husband passed away I tomorrow? I have. No you would. You have no clue. No. No clue. Yeah, this is really. I think I need one And I think that that's a great point. Like going over things with your partner. After Absolutely. Nathan and I have been uh, thinking about this. Is we have a child and kind of grow the family, whatever. And I've been looking at like like life insurance. I'm asking her like, oh, what do you think I should have or or whatnot? And and to be real, she doesn't have a clue. A good portion of our business and our net worth and. And uh, what it takes to manage them, and, and the money, and the reserves, and things like that. And just like I got this like hidden business over here in my brain, where really, you know, whatever it is, sharing and being on the same page with your significant other, and going through these exercises together, and and going through your goals together with them as well would be really important. And I agree. It, this will help your marriage, if you can, or your significant other, if you can really get syncopated on this at a high level. Goals are the same. That's. Uh, I remember I was uh, getting pre-approved for a uh, environment, mm -hmm. and it was a new lender. So they're like, "I need your docs." Like, "Oh, we got business docs. Here's all the business returns and all stuff." And here's my wife's stuff. She's like, "Wow, you guys are like a, a power couple." I said, "No, we're just on the same page. Like, right. we're like we're going toward the same goal. And when two people go toward the same goal, then it's really powerful, right? That's so a team. that's a team, right? So that's a team. So power couple for sure. It's it's beautiful because then you can start opening doors a lot quicker. Right? Opening doors a lot quicker. And if your if your spouse is not with you on that, trust me, it could bring you down. Right. So, right. any other ahas? I call myself screws with screws mixed up because I am always counting my pennies, and not in a bad way where I'm like, but I know where my money is. Yeah. And every day I check my account, and I've done that. Ever since I got right with my money, I started checking it. So that way, the day before, I know what I spent. <laughs> I know what I spent, and if I see it dip between a certain amount, I'm broke. Yeah, there's and, and, accounts that don't ever get touched. Yeah, and that's what I want to point out. We're going to get that into the next session, but we're really going to drill down into personal finance. Like, all the decisions that, what, if you don't have money, are happening there, right there. Right. Um, compound interest exercise. Go ahead and punch that in. So on page, uh, actually part one of your thing. Bob, your face is taking out of my camera instead of the thing. So on page one, I mean, on your other page, one is going to say, what is wealthy to you? So I want you to take some time to write down what wealthy is to you. And it doesn't have, you can be the wood chopper. I don't care. Right? All I want is a house in the woods and chop wood. That's fine. I'm your friend. Right? I want to be in Hawaii. I want to live here. I want to do this. I want to do this every day. I want to do this every month. I want to be able to travel. Whatever that is, write down what wealthy would look like for you. I think additionally in this exercise is what wealthy looks like for us and also what retirement looks like for us. So once again, as we mentioned, like in however amount of years it is that you want to retire, no one's given us that money, right? So knowing our number, knowing how much we need on a monthly basis and working backwards, right? If we need 6000 a month or 8000 a month or 9000 a month, on a monthly basis when we're retired, where do we need to be on a compound interest to get that? Where do, where do we need to put monthly away to get to that magic number? To get that number where we can we can get interest off that amount to pay the monthly nut to pay what we're, we're looking for. Additionally, as we analyze, like if it's a 10000 or 8000 or 6000 whatever that number is, 
How many rental properties do I need to add to? So on this exercise, fill out part one on that page. It's what does wealthy look like to you? What does that look like? What's that lifestyle? Retirement. What does it look like for you? Is it on a beach somewhere? In a cabin somewhere? John, I want to be in business and real estate all my life and put out open house signs. That's fine too. Okay. So. <laughs> no, it's actually not. <laughs> French Riviera. <laughs> French Riviera. I like that. French Riviera. Like Como in like Como in Italy. So going back on compound interest, uh, Warren Buffett, I think it was, was it 59 or 60? 60. 60. 60. About two thirds or three fourths of his wealth came after he was 60 years old. That's the power of compound. So literally, I think, I think it's worth 68 billion. Yeah. But he's like 80 now, and it really came because he had it. Yeah, maybe like fifty million at sixty, and then it just started. Yeah, he, he earned at that sixty of his sixty-eight billion now. Oh. Came after sixty years old. And he drives the same caddy, and he lives in the same home. Yeah, I'm not saying you have to do that. But he started investing when he was like twelve. Yeah, it was like yeah, if you read a story, it's like twelve insane. or fourteen. Yeah. It's crazy. He's been investing for like sixty. Yeah, he, he's a definite comment. So everyone have your started. <laughs> Get started on your wealth. So, what does your wealthy lifestyle look like? What does your retirement lifestyle look like? And that's okay if you can't dream big. If you're like John, I only can imagine having no debt and just living the way I am. That's fine too. I don't care. What does wealthy look like to you? I'm gonna say, what's the definition of wealth? I say, what does that lifestyle look like? What are you doing? What do you? Traveling, gambling, what do you want? Carnegie, what do you want? Travel and food, man. And, my, my, and concerts? My lakefront cabin. No, I, I told my wife, she's like, what do you want to do? I said, I want to travel. But I want to travel to locations where I can do triathlons. <laughs> and then the next day, I want to do a magic car tournament. So that's there you go. A magic car? Card. So a little a little secret about me, I'm, I'm really a nerd. There's a card game called Magic the Gathering, which is like a lot of teenagers. It's popular. It's 20 years ago. 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 It's still popular. It's still popular. It's still, popular. It's still, it's still really popular. over 13. Yeah, yeah. So, but and those cards are worth a lot of money. Right? Yeah, and I have a lot of them. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, a lot of money. They're very popular. It was a very popular game. And now there's like a pro tour. Literally, you can earn money playing on tour. So, uh, and, and a little secret of mine is, my senior in high school, I was actually, I qualified for the national okay. championship oh, <laughs> in magic. Nice. And I went to Columbus, Ohio oh, <laughs> and competed and finished 13th in the country in Magic the Gathering. So. <laughs> that doesn't surprise me. <laughs> Did you say 18, 13? <laughs> what? How old were you? I was 17, 18 at the time. Hmm. Imagine if you would have went to Columbus, Ohio and bought investment property. I know. Oh, God damn. A couple of them. Exactly. If you go to Ohio right now, but. Even 13th. Yeah. I, I, and 13th, I was, I was 17, 18. I won $10,000, but it's 13th. And I was like, I should just like go put a down payment on something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, $10,000 that long ago was. Yeah. Like, oh, it was a lot of money. I, I was like, I don't even know what happened to that, actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's how bad it was, right? I don't even know what happened to it. I were magic cards, right? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't spend it all on magic cards, but I know. So. Uh, everyone got their wealthy lifestyle? Technically, that was an investment. Because <laughs> I went money. I, good return on investment, right? Flight, hotel. Hey, $10,000. Okay. Um, now I want you to think how much money a month would it take to live what you just put down? What you put down right there, how much money per month would you need to pull that off? <laughs> <laughs> you know my goals. I know your goals, so that's okay, that's fine. How much would you need to pull that number off? I mean, what come on, you guys know you guys have a sense of money, right? How much you how much a dollar a thousand a month, two thousand a month, three thousand a month, four thousand you know. I mean you're all realtors, so I know you know, right? So <laughs> how much a month would you have to have? Coming into your into your checking account every month to pay for that lifestyle. Anyone got it? Yeah. You write down a number. 
That's fine. Well, don't just, how much money would you need to pay for that? Can I go to part two? What? Where does that go? No, no, no. We're going to get to part two. But in part one, somewhere along in part one, put a number per month. Pretty <laughs> goal Nice. And so I laid the whole thing out. Okay, so that's how much that number per month is how much passive income per month you need to have to meet your wealth goals. That's your freedom number. That's your number you need. So now you can compound interest, depending on how old you are now, versus how many years till you want to retire or make this goal happen. What are we gonna assume? How much are interest rate? 8%? Maybe seven, eight, yeah. Conservative yeah. seven and a half. Yeah, so seven percent. So in that calculator, if you put an annual return and how much you need to put every month away. To get that amount, that would return that amount. So take so so what you need to do is take the amount you have. Okay, take the monthly amount you have. Okay, which is whatever you put down times it by twelve. That's how much you need in interest paid to you per year. <laughs> so take your monthly amount. Times it by 12. That's how much interest, passive income you need per year to make that work. Well, it's not doing it. You have to make that calculation. What's that? I said, I'm going to keep working. You got to keep working. Okay, you got that amount? Now, you're going to put in that compound interest calculator. If you put a money aside now, think about how much you need if you had a conservative, um, eight, you had an 8% return on your investment. How big would that number need to be for you to average, I don't know, what am I saying? So say I get $10 million. If I times that, if I times that by 5%, that means I'm going to take in $500,000 per year on the backside. So what you need to figure out is how much I need to, what number do I need to get to to make sure I have enough passive income on the backside? So someone give me a number. So what's the number? How much? Is it monthly? How much for the year do you need? 400 grand. 400 grand? So you need, say we're going to do, say you're retired, 400 grand, you're going to be conservative with your investments because you don't want to be risky. So say we're only getting a 5% return, which is super conservative, right? I'm only getting 5% return, it's pretty safe, I'm not gonna lose any money, right? right. If I did eight, oh, sorry, 800,000. If I had $8 million and I timed it by 0 0.05, that would result in $400,000 interest. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So for your $400,000 a year to pay for your dream, she needs $8 million in the bank mm -hmm. or in investments, mm -hmm. theoretically. Now, you don't have $8 million now, so the compound interest calculator is saying, how much do I need to put aside so I can get to eight million by the time I want to retire? Does that make sense? Yeah. So anyone have a number? Not follow me. So you take your number, monthly number, times it by twelve. That's how much you need in interest. We're going to assume five percent. So we're going to say, how much money do you need to have to return? So anyone have another number? How much? Six hundred thousand a month a year. So just think, oh, sorry, a month, a year. So think about this. If we're going to use a 5% conservative interest rate when you retire, so if you're at 12, you're just a, I mean, you're at 12, what did you say? 600,000. 600,000, you're going to need $12 million in the bank. It's 600,000. What if I want 50 million a year? Then you'll need 150 million? So real quick, just for you'll like, need a billion, so. the example that, that Amy just gave, right? Yeah. So let's say you started with $10,000 and you have 30 years to invest this. If you're in your 30s, at 7.5%. You have to put away $6,000 So $72,000 a year. For how long? For 30 years. 30 years. You get to 8 million? 7.5. 30 years, $6,000. So that's just. starting this at a great age. Wow! I'm so far yeah. behind. <laughs> so age does matter in this calculation. Age does matter. So it's small as matter. 
So if you don't have that time horizon, then that's, let, I want you to do this exercise because you need to know, if I don't have that time horizon, then I need to cheat the system. And that's where you, you need to become an active investor where you're looking for 10, 12% returns. You gotta get very savvy at investing, right? It, you know, I'm gonna go rentals. I'm gonna try to do good rentals and get more than 8% return on my money on rentals and use leverage to do that, right? So you gotta think about how you, and you can come up with plans where you can be more aggressive, but you're gonna to have to be super focused, mm -hmm. right? Super focused on the money, super focused on your business, you're generating enough money to get the investments you need in a quick period. But whatever that number is, just know that's how much money you need to get to. Mm -hmm. Times that by 12, assume 5%, and that's gonna be where you need to end up so that when you're done, you're like, I'm quitting, I'm doing what I want, I'm going to take all my money and investments. I'm going to move it into conservative status so I don't lose it. I'm going to put it at about 5% interest, and I'm going to live off the interest. Right. So real quick, I'll do something a little more conservative. If you put $1,000 away a month for 30 years, you're looking at 1.3. 1.3. Roughly what you're going to have. Right? Or you said 30 years? For 30 years. So literally, if you put $1,000 a month for 30 years, you're going to be a millionaire. And that's roughly going to be around that seven to eight thousand dollars that you'd be able to have monthly if you're taking money out, earning about a five percent interest. So a little more like reasonable goal there, and I think most people should at least be around there. About a million dollars to one point five, realistically, is pretty close to what you want to retire with. Yeah. Be around seven to eight thousand a month. Yeah. Additionally, if you're able to pick up a rental property or two rental properties, and that thing's paid off in thirty years. And then you're getting about $2,500 to $3,000 a month. Let's say net, because we know rent's probably going to go up over time. Then you got $2,500 for that rental property, and you got $7,500 from that million dollars you just put away. Then you got $10,000, right? I think this is how you kind of add up the different assets and avenues of getting that Correct. dollar amount that you're looking for. Maybe Social Security will be there. Maybe it won't. Maybe you'll have another $2,500 for that. It's hard to, to bank on things like that with all the, the news that's out right so in your experience, how many rentals do you need to get that $2,500? Well, if it's paid off, like, so um, homes appreciate about 3% annually over, like, a 30-year period. That's kind of been historical. This past year has probably thrown those numbers off a little bit. Um, rents are pretty similar. So they appreciate about 3 to 5% annually. So the duplexes that I own, you know, I'm getting about $1,600 in rent. We're looking at another compound number here. Um, but I would say, you know, each side of a duplex, maybe you're going to be at about 2200 on each side. Let's say in 30 years, maybe you'd be a little higher than that. So then you have to subtract, you know, your taxes and your utilities and right, things right. like that. So I'm kind of banking on how I'm kind of averaging in my mind. If I'm earning about $3,000 in gross income right now, I'm kind of thinking it's probably going to be pretty similar to that as a net in 30 years. Because your rents are going to go up, and a lot of your expenses are going to be fairly fixed. They're going to go up gradually, but not as much as rents. And I would say like a duplex, maybe about 2500 to 3000 is what maybe you could expect as a net if it's paid off. Right. So, so at, how many of those do you need to, to net 25000 So he's saying well, well, on a duplex one, right one now. property, one duplex. Oh, well, that's you, well, you 3000 in 30 yeah. years. So. Right, okay. Well, years. assuming you put a three-year mortgage on it and you pay it off in 30 years, right? So, yeah. Yeah. Assuming, what's that? I said I don't have 30 years. <laughs> well, you put it on a 15-year loan. Yeah, put it on a yeah. 15-year loan. I'm just kind of curious. Right. Well, the other, you know, and a lot of these is, is how can you increase your gross on some of them? If you're doing a 15-year loan, then maybe you want to do a short-term rental on Airbnb type thing to be able to to break even or make a little money on that 15 year loan because your mortgage payment's going to be higher. Right. Because right? you're splitting it in half. But right. what you're doing is giving, putting more hustle to make the investment work, right? right. I'm going to make sure it's clean and I'm going to make sure it turns over right. I'm going to get five star ratings and all those things. But I can get more, um, and I can put it on a 15 year loan, get a shorter horizon, but I still make money over that time period, right? So, but you're putting hustle to the matter to make it work. So, so there's a lot of different ways you can peel it, but I agree. So I, I do, investments i have 401ks and i try to make sure all the money i'm investing in, fa in fact like i'll be transparent if i invest the money that i'm currently investing and just tax deferred in tax deferred entities through business my wife's business 
IRAs, all those things. Just not, not, not investing in businesses or anything like that, just those, I'm probably gonna end up around eight to $10 million. Now, every time I buy a rental, my horizon, $2,500 to $3,000 more a month. At the, I'm looking at that, right? I don't care about necessarily about how much money I make right now. I care about how much I'm gonna make at, when I hit that. So that's the, the businesses, and I like to look at the businesses and my rentals and investment in real estate as additions to my base, right? I wanna get my base right where I'm investing the money, maximizing the deferring as much income from taxes as possible. Great, get that right. And then I'm gonna, I'm gonna add on to it with profit share. I'm gonna add on to, you know, with a, this rental and then another rental. And now I know, okay, now I'm getting to a place where I think I need to be, right? So I wanna. So you can scale it actually pretty fast. I mean, Bobby, how long? When did you buy your first rental? Uh, five years ago. Five years ago. How many do you know now? Uh, I got 21 units, which is about 10 properties. So think about that. Gary Keller says people overestimate what they can do in one year, but severely underestimate what they can do in three to five years. I am wholeheartedly convinced that anyone, I don't care where you start in life, I don't care where you are right now, I wholeheartedly believe in five years you can become a if you work it. I, I, I formally believe that. So we are doing it. You started here today. Exactly. Started when you signed up. That's right. Yeah. That's what we so I, I believe with five years of focus, and even shorter than that, but you can tell Bobby is a good example. You could, you could exceed a, a, a million dollars in net worth within five years, especially in real estate. It's a, you're in a great, great group. All right, we good? Good. All right. How can you calculate on that calculator what your monthly be? Assume 5% interest. So whatever, when you do the compound calculator, it comes to a total amount you're gonna have in the bank, right? You're gonna assume 5% interest. So say 0.05, and that's how much you're gonna get per year from that amount, times 0.05. You mean how much you have to contribute monthly? No, I got all that, but what you- So whatever it ends up at, so say it's gonna end up at- out from that. So you don't, you're not gonna, well, the idea is that you don't draw down your investment, although you can. You can say, I got to $4 million, I'm going to draw it down, or I got to one3 and I'm going to draw it down. You can. But ideally, you'd want to keep it at one3 and just live off the interest that it earns. Right. And that's why so, Bobby was saying, if you had like one3 you're going to earn about $7,000 a month in okay. interest. You know, not, not interest per se, but being able to take out money plus that 5% interest, that's probably going to give you about that 25 to 30 years if you retire at 60, probably maybe it's 80. So 85, yeah. We're not financial advisors. Probably. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we'll, we'll bring in a financial advisor too and he's gonna talk about stuff too. Rough numbers that we've done. Okay, wealth mindset truth number two. All wealthy people live within their means. <laughs> wealth is money that is not spent, but saved and invested. Wealth is what you don't see. Wealth is what you don't see. Raul was a good example. We were on a boat ride on our ALC trip, and I found out Raul's got super. Come here, tell us, tell us your story, Raul. Come on, Raul. ALC member. Tell me about how you got serious. So I'm told you save hundred thousand. What'd you do? So I, I figured because um, I'm very big on investing strategies called the Bird Method, uh, where you buy a property, you rent it, you rehab, and you repeat. And I figured that I needed to save up to a hundred grand, more or less, to start playing with that money. So I got very focused on getting to a hundred thousand, and then I started investing from there. How, how, when, when did you get serious about it? Probably about two years ago. And how long did it take you to get a hundred thousand? Two years. Saved. Saved in the bank. Yeah. And you didn't have a hundred thousand before. You were starting pretty even, right? So. Yeah. It was just, you're just spending your money, living life, right? Got right. serious, two years later, $100,000. So that's why I said, good example, right? Did you know he was doing that? No, because wealth is not what, is what you don't see. No, because no. if you were spending it, then you don't have it anymore. Right? <laughs> yeah, and what Raul was talking about, that, that method versus just buying a property and putting 20 to 25% down is if you're buying a property in California, $100,000. You, know, you got one property, which would be $100,000. And then we're always going to start over for two to three years, or whatever it takes to save up another money. Versus 
you're able to buy it and use that sweat equity by rehabbing the property, and you're able to only put down maybe five or ten percent, or sometimes you could get all your money out and then you yeah. So essentially, saying buy a fixer, hold it, fix it up, and then with your own money, and then refi. Now that it has a higher value, refi it out to try and get your money back out. This hundred thousand you put in, try and get it back out and do it. And because rents are high, you can rent it and still still pay for that mortgage. Right, yeah, because if you buy the traditional way, they might ask you twenty percent down, right? Yeah. If you do the traditional way, you're going to tie up that money. Yeah. So now he's going to put a hundred thousand down, buys a rental, gets a return on it, yeah. but now he's got to go two more years, or maybe one and a half now because he's got this rental income, yeah. and save the next one. So the birth rate, and we'll go over the birth rate. But I, I want you to point out is he got very serious about living within your means. And actually, he got very serious about living below his means so he could save. So what did you sacrifice when you got serious? Well, I mean, I was spending all my money uh, in shoes and whatnot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, yeah, exactly, right, yeah, yeah I know. <laughs> um, and then, I, you know, I, I realized that it me to get to where I was to get, that, you know, get very serious about my spending habits, you know. So did you? No, no. <laughs> no, but I consider consider them as assets. Yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they're right up. But you you stopped you slowed things down, right? I did, yeah, yeah. big time. And but, you cut you cut a bunch of expenses, right? Yeah, and it goes in the lifestyle because Raul made a lot more money those last two or three years, but maybe he's spending the same amount of money as he was two years ago, and it allowed him to be able to put that money away. And I'll be able to buy, you know, I know you did a couple flips recently, and he's been doing that well property. Right? <laughs> okay, man. What was that? <laughs> Additionally, with these, like, the best thing, one of the best things about investment properties is if you have a tough time saving money, when your tenant is paying down your mortgage, it's a savings account you cannot touch. It's like, <laughs> every one of my mortgages. <laughs> You know, it's four hundred, five hundred, or six hundred dollars a month that's being paid down on the principal every month that I can't even touch. I guess you could do cash out refi, but not, not something you want to do. But it's that private savings. Yeah, but you know, the people that he changed his life pretty quickly, but all the times I don't look for. If you have credit, I want to put. If you have credit card debt, you're leaving a lifestyle beyond it. Accurate. At yeah. some point, it's kind of cutting up the credit card, especially yeah. if you're having an issue with it. I had to do it early in my career. The first two, three years when I was flipping and doing all this stuff, I was maxing out my credit cards to pay for various things and then over leveraged to an extent. And then I was like, I'm not doing that anymore. I went all cash for like two or three years. And then just the and past two, two years, then I started rolling around with some more debt and leveraging it out a bit more. But. So you got serious with your debt, you cut it out, and you may have slowed down a little bit, but you wanted to get it financially sound, right? right. You got it financially right. sound. And I was taking more risks at the beginning, and then, like, I'm just going to go cash, and then I built up my reserves, and then now I'm back to still having the reserves, but being able to leverage money and use that money to, to buy more assets. So Spending to show money to show how much money you have is the opposite of being involved. I was gonna bring that so up. some of you have lifestyles. Mm -hmm. I was gonna bring that up, and Bobby's comment on Instagram or Facebook or whatever. You see these people with a flashy Lambo and doing this whatever. Mm -hmm. If you don't know it, most of that's fake. Yeah, and they know we as Americans are consumers. Oh, took it, okay. and we want to look like each other or look like whoever you mm -hmm. think is beautiful or wealthy. And it's just a, it's just a horrible way to look at the world. When, like that's you said, John. Um, you want to internalize what wealth is to you, right? If, yeah. if it is having those flashy things and setting yourself up for that is great, but buying the stuff broke, working on a credit card isn't the ideal way of going, right? right? So we have, I mean, we all have those clients that, you know, bought, have $1,400 car payments a month, right? And are struggling to find a house even though they make good money, right? So it's just internalizing that and then communicating that with yourself. When you're buying the toys and the luxury items, it's not like don't do it. It's do it with passive income or do it with cash. Yeah. Michael Soar is a great example of that. The guy owns a crazy amount of Ferraris and has a very exotic car collection. If we didn't know that, but yeah. <laughs> he bought them all with cash, right? With cash, literally. And cash. other people, are, it's passive income. You know, whatever. Don't necessarily spend the money that's coming in on your your normal paychecks. You know, use passive income or cash.
make sure you put the stuff away for savings, investments. And we got serious about our money a few years ago, and now we pay all vacations, everything cash. Right. So you got a vacation going to Africa next year, right? Yeah. So uh, this is going to be a tough pill to swallow. If you, most people, if you truly want to make life changes to start on the path to wealth, you may need to sacrifice your quality of life for a short period of time to reset things for profit. Mm -hmm. Depending on where you, it's not everybody, but most people, if you really want to reset your finances, you're going to have to. I know you strive to get a certain lifestyle you have right now, and you're like, I don't want to go back, and that's the toughest pill I have to swallow. For some, I was coaching an agent the other day, and I go, look, um, um, they were very happy about moving into a better neighborhood, and I like this neighborhood, and I don't want to move to it. And I said, look, you, you're approved. You can go buy a home, but then, then you're just making more. You have to earn more money because now you have mortgage and all this stuff. And, and I was like, why don't you – Go buy a duplex, live in one side, rent out the other. Your mortgage is really little. You can save up a lot of money quickly. And then you can go buy another house if you want to buy a house in that neighborhood. But you're going to have to sacrifice for about six months to a year. That means because you're going to have to downgrade neighborhoods because you got to go to a duplex that's in a lesser quality neighborhood <laughs> to do it. And they were like, oh, that's I just fought to get here. And I go, yeah, you got to go back six months. But think about that. Six months to a year, you go backwards. You move out by another, say you buy a, a house, you already have now a duplex paying you two rents that you bought with three, 5% down, right? I think and, it's Dave Ramsey that put it, live like no one else, so later you can live like no one else. Yeah. I heard someone say this, and say some of that's like, you can play. Anyone can play, it just depends on when, if you want to play in your 20s and 30s, you can play but you're going to pay for it in your 40s and 50s, right? So um, depends when you want to play. I know it's fun then, but, man, it gets really hard later on, right? So, really, so think about this. I know it's a tough pill to swallow. Think about where you are, but you may need to reset your lifestyle. And maybe that's not moving, but that may be like we're not spending this now, right? I'm not buying shoes for two years, right? So, I'm only going out to eat once a week. Yeah, I'm only going on once a week. I got to kick that Starbucks habit. I got to stop gambling, right? I don't know, whatever you do. Just, you know. The car payment. The car payment, yeah. yeah. shiny cars. Yeah, right? Who's, who keeps that up? Car payments, goddamn car payments. Gas, walk to work, walk to show your clients. <laughs> <laughs> See you on Tuesday next week. I'm sorry, hold on. Hello, transportation. <laughs> okay, you guys all have the alchemy of money. Um, I want you to on two. Sorry. On two, it says... What hidden commitment? What hidden committing commitments that you get in the way of your wealth goals? So, what right now? What right now? And this is part two. What is what is getting in your way of saving money? Uh, you can just work on your document right here. Just work on this document. Step two. What is getting in the way right now? Current commitments you're doing. Current things you're spending money on right now. No. Donna's living a very frugal life. <laughs> Reset this thing, sorry. I'm sorry, Carl. <laughs> he keeps raising his hand. Are you following me? You stop. Right. Yeah. I thought you guys, when you do that, you're waving them. Yeah. That's what, that's what we wanted you to think. <laughs> so think about that. What is, what, what, do you know what that is? What do you need to give me life? Oh, I know what. All right, you know what? Good. What commitment do you currently have that you need to give up? What? Impulse spending. Impulse spending. I like that. Amazon, Impulse spending. Yeah. Get rid of the Amazon. Oh, app. Amazon. Yeah. Get rid of the Amazon app. Make sure you can only log in on your desktop. There was a time, I, yeah, well, I was like, we're no more credit card debt. We charged all in one card. We paid off a month. But literally, any other credit cards, we didn't want to toast our credit, so we kept the credit cards open. We just never activate them. Literally, they sit somewhere. We don't even activate the card. They just sit there. Right? You just open with seven thousand dollars credit. They just have credit. We don't even use them, right? So. Yeah, but after a while, don't they kind of like dormant and they close them? You don't use them? Well, I don't know. They have a closed house. Because <laughs> you're on some of them, you're paying a ninety-nine dollar fee. Yeah, I make sure we don't have that. Yeah. 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 They want that ninety-nine. Okay, so everyone got what they need to get rid of. Uh, part, part three is what are some non-negotiables? What are some non-negotiables that you have to have? And that will sort of dictate what you can what you need to adjust in your lifestyle. Right? 
Are they not negotiables? I gotta, I gotta have my kids here, right? Like, I gotta pay for this. I gotta pay for this. Some non-negotiables. What are non-negotiables? No, what are non-negotiables? Well, it's different if you have a family versus single, right? <laughs> That's definitely different. Different non-negotiables. School for caliber. School for caliber. Yeah. Um, spot it. Uh, how, house cleaning? House cleaning is a non negotiable. <laughs> yeah, it could be house cleaning. Like, I am going to hustle. I don't have time to clean my house. This is a non negotiable. You know, I'm not going to clean my house. That's fine. I don't care. But you just need to be very clear. And what this will help you is be very clear what you spend your money on. Be very deliberate about what you spend your money on. Because all every time you do that, you're making a choice. You're making a choice about your money. And even though you bust out that card, Think about all the things that automatically charge your account. Those are all turned off. Yeah. If you don't even know. We evaluated that like every quarter, every six months, every year. There's a bunch of things that just kind of keep. Trust me, when I, I sit with, I sit with uh, Meg and my assistant every month, we go over finances, and the first thing they say is, what can we cut? Every month. I say, I want to lose $10 a month. I say, what can we cut? <laughs> I think last year, when COVID first went down, we were talking to our business coach. That was the first thing. Evaluated our P&O, cut just about everything. Yeah, everything and could. And reevaluated. And this year has been like night and day difference since last year with things that we did not need and realized that we do. Did that with the office? We did that with the office. Yeah. yeah. We, we took over. The potentials were here, and we cut everything we could. Right? Yeah, that was, it was the biggest gut punch because you didn't know what was happening to it. So it was a great. No, we were, I call it an exercise. It was a life event mm -hmm. and it really benefited us from that past 18 And I, I can tell you, about four years ago, my wife and I got very serious about this. We had sort of lifestyle creep. I had a big house, 4,000 square foot house, 4,200 square foot suite. We, had a, we were backed up to a private 30 acre park with three mm -hmm. pool, like poles and ponds. and. I could literally walk on the jog on the river, American River, mm -hmm. and um, we could afford the payment and everything. Don't get me wrong, but we started getting serious about like, cut, 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 and then we realized there's some things we can't cut. Like we got to have the AC mm -hmm. and heater. We got to have the mortgage payment, right? Do we need three ACs. <laughs> <laughs> four thousand square foot house. No, it's a four thousand square foot house, and it was costing in the summer. It was like seven, eight hundred dollars on the PG&E bill, right? And I was like, damn, right. So we made the conscious to move. I went to 4,000 to 2,600 square foot because we cut everything and then we said, we want to cut more. Are we willing to adjust our lifestyle to get to where we want to go? And we cut and we're super happy. And that, that cut really put us on a trajectory to a millionaire status within a couple of years. <clears throat> so, and what's that mean for your future, John? Uh, you know, I, I don't want to show any. Literally, I bought a post of stand in the backyard. I put fake grass in the back because mm -hmm. I was like, I don't want to even spend on lawn maintenance on my house. Mm -hmm. I, I moved to an HOA that does a front yard because I was like, I don't want to spend on it. Because <laughs> right? I'm about to make a bad mistake and go to that four thousand. <laughs> <laughs> and then when I get to your age, maybe I'll go back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, one, it, you got to have one, right? What? You have to do this one. Yeah. No, I, I, I want to say the house didn't service us. I had a family. My mom was living with us, so it worked very well for us. Mm -hmm. But at some point, you got to realize what your living space works. But my mom moved out, and it became very senseless for us to have that kind of size house. Uh, we had a pool. We had a great clubhouse with a pool, and it opens during the summer. And I remember two summers around, I'm like, kids, let's go to the pool. And I'm like, nah, right? Mm -hmm. Sitting on there. Two years, I was like, why am I paying for all this? Yeah. I'm the only one you, running around the park. They're just you know, like, <laughs> like, why? And so then you just think about your lifestyle where it isn't. It worked when we were younger, but it didn't work now. And so we, we made the adjustments. and, and our, our kids are fine. They don't even care. So, mm -hmm. honestly, don't care. Right? So, I told everyone I want to be the hidden millionaire. I want everyone on the block not to know I am, mm -hmm. and I just am. Right? Mm -hmm. Was that kid we from that house to the? I think we were in like a five thousand square foot house at Catalina, and like my parents were just kind of like, we don't need all this. Like, what was the point? So we jumped back. To yeah. The Someone asked me, "Is John? When did you get that big house?" It's like, I had it. I don't need it. Right? Yeah. yeah. I don't need. It. In fact, I want to so work. Yeah, I don't want to work. He's like, who wants to work? Like, give me a condo. Here's my dry cleaning. Yeah. Right? Yeah. What? Okay, anyways, we move forward. All right. Well, so what is the one change you're going to make in your life? Everyone got to change? <clears throat> Impulse spending? What do you got to do? How are you going to get that commitment? 
Stop. That's that's the only way to do it. Disconnect your credit card today. Just disconnect your credit card wallet. Your wallet. Take all the cards out of your wallet on your on your phone. I've been like I said, I'm fortunate knowing Bob and then direct you that a lot of the things that I was doing, going out all the time, being single, going to party, and spending nights out of the bar. I wouldn't care about spending two or three hundred bucks on a bar tab, but then you know my bills are kind of tight. When I'm like at the end of the month, I'm like, oh man, how am I gonna make sure that's paid on time, right? So we've eliminated a lot of that stuff, and like I said, I've paid off all my debts this year. Yeah, I mean, you went from probably forty, 40 fifty thousand, yeah. forty to fifty thousand dollars in debt, like non mortgage debt, and in nine ten months gone. It's just about being perfect. So get a girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> Hurry <laughs> up, right? Hurry up, Mary now. Okay, Mary now. <laughs> right. uh, mindset wealth number five money has its own rules and its own disciplines, and wealthy people surround themselves to, all, to always grow and help them understand their rules better and keep the inner focus on wealth building. So, you're never going to always be in wealth building unless you start surrounding yourself. Literally, I take a walk every morning and somebody I post my walks. I always, always listen to podcasts about wealth during the walk. I always do because it always makes my resets my mindset. It sets my mindset. Resets my mindset. Right? So, check your financial sets at least once a month. So, you need to get in the habit of you get your wealth thing, put it into a spreadsheet. There's a bunch of spreadsheets you can download online and update it every month. You will start making better choices if you look at it every month. I guarantee it. <laughs> Surround yourself with those people who think and have a higher net worth than you. They say you're the net worth on average of your five people around you. Who are the five people you hang around most? What is their net worth? Level up. <laughs> Level up. Yeah, Level like up. Yeah. Business. It's their net worth. It's their mindset. Mm-hmm. You know, I think that's what's so great about this office and our ALC and talking with Raul and talking about stuff like this. Taylor and you and Michael Soares, like. My world changed when I came to this office for sure, just being around like minded people that mm-hmm. wanna wanna push the envelope. I'll say at our LC meetings, the best part about it is we take like the first half of it and all we do is mastermind. Where's the market, what's happening, how we can make things better. Mm-hmm. And that's a high level discussion because you're talking with millionaires in the room talking, right? And and it was great because last time Lindsay sat in, now you can sit on an ALC meeting. You can't speak to anything, but you can listen and she just listens because she wants that higher mindset. She gets it, right? We, I've been talking to her about this, like get your mindset right. So think about your five people. And if it's not right, you need to level up. The good part about it is you already have some you already know, right? <laughs> so, so start thinking things. Um, I, I, I recommend you read or listen to books and podcasts on financial wealth and wealth building. It doesn't have to be universal all the time, but you need to keep this an inner focus. Remember, it's an inner focus for out of result, right? So um, one thing we do, um, you should be tracking your net worth, your personal budget, your business budget, your profit and loss and balance sheets, and return on investments ROI. We're going to go over that in the next few sessions on how to do these documents. But the net worth one we went over today. We'll go over these ones in the next few sessions. Um, surround your people. Who's your five closest? Right? Think about that. I dare you to listen, list it down who your five closest people are. I say adults. And, and, ask them and, and, just, and the next to it, put their, you, you know, kind of just their estimated net worth. How much money do they have? Funds that you write me off. <laughs> <laughs> I always like evaluate myself like the number of people in the industry and around for like six years and just like it, it just forces you to change your mindset. Like some of the lenders in this in Sacramento area, some of the builders, some of the investors, like just constantly following what they're doing, it just motivates you. Right? And, you and the good part with social media and podcasts is like I listen to Bigger Pockets a lot and it's David Green who's a tremendous realtor in the Bay Area and Brandon. And I listen to them all the time. I don't even have to be their friends, but I listen to them so much. It's like they're one of my five, right? Like I, I'm, I'm getting that knowledge constantly from them, right? So you, the good part about social media and, and on the internet day is you can surround yourself with someone that is bigger than you, and they don't even have to be in proximity, right? So, yeah, exactly. So you can also jump on the forums. There's space. There's all kinds of great stuff. Yeah. So um, listen to pause. That's right. So see the next slide. So just so you know, and Bobby said it. Um, I, I, I do, one thing that's not on here is I do recommend you get someone who can mentor you. Uh, Michael's been a big influence in my life since, since um, I took over as managed broker and then essentially team leader, just on how 
on how to think about money and think about wealth, and that helps a lot. I was on that journey already, but he's took it a he's taken it a long way. Um, so finding people that have wealth that can help you get there. Um, also, I recommend some books, just some uh, some some books, and then also some podcasts. I'm sure there's more that you can find. These are just things that um, uh, Bobby and I do. How many of you guys have read Rich Dad Poor Dad? Uh, that's, that's, a, that's a seminal book for our, our generation. It's like the Bible for yeah. wealth yeah. building. And, and when you go on bigger pockets, like I always listen to them religiously. At the end of every segment, they ask like four questions. Mm-hmm. One of them is What, what is you? your favorite business or real estate related book? And Rich Dad Poor Dad is probably 90% of the, uh, the guests yeah. that come on. It's, it's Rich that Rich book Rich that Rich. really changed their mindset to get into investing and business owning. Like that, so all of those are great books. So, I don't say it has to be every book, but you got to be listening to some books, you got to be listening to some podcasts. Try to plan it, even if you listen to it once a week, that's fine. But you got to get in rhythm to listening and reading these things because it'll help you think better and make better choices. It's really about changing your mindset so you make better choices, right? Better yeah, choices. just like how you look at everything to change. Gary Keller's podcast, Think Like a CEO, he had one. Season, I was specifically all oh, well. Season five, season five. All, yeah. The most recent was yeah, all about wealth one. building, and the other four or five is about running your business, being able to do things like that. The last one was specifically about wealth, and then bigger pockets. Like I've been investing in real estate for like five or six years now, and I just found them, discovered them about a year ago, like during COVID. I was my mind was blown away. Like why didn't I tap into this years ago? And I felt like I would have been light years ahead of where I am today. Every week they have two to three episodes, amazing guests. Um, Brandon Turner and, and David Green, as he just said. KW. <laughs> one's a KW agent, but they all have different guests on about all different types of niches of real estate investing. We're talking about flips, we're talking about rental properties, we're talking about the Burr method we just talked about, short term rentals, hacking. house hacking, and talking about mobile home investments, mobile parks, sorry. Yeah. So there's just a ton of niches and they're constantly mm-hmm. having. Amazing content and information, and really just change how you analyze. Yeah, Bobby turned me on to this, and I'm a religious yeah. listener now. Just religious. I listened to it this morning. There's so. 500 episodes, and you can cherry pick through. Cherry pick, yeah. Like I've gone through, and just in a year, I've probably listened to about 500 episodes. Yeah. There's actually a, a rookie bigger pocket uh, yeah. podcast. Yeah, podcast. If you're just like, a rookie, yeah, starting out. Already, yeah. They also have they have a bunch of branches. There's one that's called Money that just started. And I listen to the Money one sometimes. But I like. I was thinking about this class. I was thinking about this class and doing the content. So we started to start listening to the money one, right? Get, get really quick on money. So there's a, I highly recommend if you like to listen to things, it's also a good habit. Pair it with your exercise. And then suddenly you're getting wealth knowledge. At the same time, you're getting exercise. <laughs> so it's beautiful. So, um, but these are some of the things that you should be looking at. You should be surrounding yourself with people. You should be reading things. You should be looking at your numbers every month, at least. All right. Uh, we're a little over five minutes. That's okay. That is our class for uh, mindset. This is Munchin' Real Estate. John, we step two. Step two is two weeks from now. So two weeks from now, same time, same place, same place. We're going to go into personal finances. If you have a budget, if you have a personal budget, bring a print out. If you don't have one, we're going to construct one. And then we're going to talk about how you should... You transitioning yourself to cash, cash savings for investing, cash savings for vacations and things like that, so that you can start paying things cash and start using credit to do it, right? So we're gonna we're gonna tell you how to organize your finances so that you can start saving money. It's gonna be tough because when we talk about what you need to your step two and three here, what you need to cut, when you do your personal budget, and I want it accurate. So what happens is you're maybe gonna have to look at your bank statements because if you say I clear a thousand dollars a month extra every month, but then your bank account has four dollars in it, your budget's not accurate. Right? You're spending money that you're not telling yourself because you want to hide it because you're like, I don't want people to know I'm spending that. Right? So, so the worst person you can lie to is yourself. Right. The worst person you can lie to. So, so thank you everyone. Um, on behalf of Bobby and I, we appreciate you coming down and, and doing this and spending time with us. Um, we'll do this next series two weeks from now, and we're very happy. Locked out. Get your, get your people this last slide. Get your people around you. Get your, get your stuff. Get your numbers. Get that net sheet. Get network tight, right? So thank you, everyone. Have a great day.